Hello, everyone, and welcome to Call Your Hits, a Storm Riders Airsoft podcast. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Today, I've got Matt in the virtual studio with me. Matt has been on the podcast before. He's one of our Discord community members uh, from the West Coast of the United States. And Matt recently went to a really interesting event um, that was um, Star Wars themed, but for um, you know copyright reasons, it was not at all Star Wars themed. It was right. uh, Galactic Disorder, I think is what it was called. It was the uh, Galactic Civil War. Galactic Civil War, thank you. And I think... One of the cool things that Airsoft can do is give us the opportunity to role play a little bit in uh, in different sort of universes. Like we often think of role playing in the context of Airsoft and, you know, just military engagements, right? Where we, you know, pretend to get, you know, wounded and then call for a medic, stuff like that. But there's such a wide range and such a wild world available of sort of live action role playing, which sometimes called LARPing. Uh, and I'm I'm really excited to, to share the experience because I think it really showcases how cool Airsoft can be at creating those experiences for people. And plus, I haven't talked to Matt about this a whole lot, so I'm really curious myself to uh, to learn more about this event. So, Matt, thanks so much for joining us, man. Of course. Uh, and to all our listeners, welcome to Call Your Hits, a Storm Riders Airsoft podcast. Not you, Squirrel Man. So why don't you tell me a little bit about like about this event in general? So I understand that it was sort of like a it was a, like a LARP event for sure, but also like a, a Milsim style, like there was objectives and stuff like that, right? OK, so it was a basic uh, it had a whole background and everything. Right. So the M Empire needed a resource on the planet, the coaxium and the rebellion came because the Empire was there. And so you have your basic blue or green on tan force on force, whatever like literally every other milsim in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you have your PMCs and you have NPCs and all that like you'd have in those, except it was all slightly, uh, you know, from a galaxy far, far away. Like instead of gotcha. private military contractors wearing like say urban camo, it was the Mandalorian guild. Wow. Yeah. Uh, your NPCs, we had outlaws. We had guys dressed as up, up as a Han Solo and we had a couple of Wookiees on the field. Uh, some guys with some really stupendous blasters and costumes and everything so everybody was super in character including like a, a yeah everybody gets a unique chain code with a persistent economy everybody gets a certain number of credits at the beginning you have ways to earn credits and you can buy in-game upgrades oh wow like uh i myself played as a mandalorian so aside from the the early uh like the whole thing started off with the mayor making an announcement in the town and then the rebels and local insurgents attacking the Empire and then uh, the Empire and the Mandalorians trying to get a little bit of order and then slept separating off into our separate uh, objectives. Right. So then the Empire wanted to gather coaxium from all over the place. And in order to do that, they had to, like, get some Wookiees or other people out to them and do things. The rebels obviously wanted to stop this. And then they spread their their uh, the rebel propaganda. Right. Like they put posters up all over the place. And there were a few in-game things that literally anybody could find. Like there were a few Camtonos uh, that were just like full of credits out there, right? Mm -hmm. Or I think it's Cantono. Uh, anyway, and so there was a lot of stuff to do out there over the two days. It was a uh, it was a two-day event with Saturday and then Sunday morning with the option to camp like the Rebels and the Empire. Or the Imp Imps actually uh, camped on the field because uh, it was done in a big rock quarry. Okay. It's this place in Missouri called The Rock. Uh and what it was is, yeah, it's a big, huge rock core that they have let overgrow again into just a big airsoft field. So it has wooded area. It has uh, several villages built up into it. Mm -hmm. uh, a few like small towns, a little lake, even like a lot. Well, it's just the bottom of a quarry. So it's gathered water over the years, but they made like a fishing village around it. Right. So gotcha. there's a whole there's a whole world in set up in this place. And there were maybe 150 people out there total with uh, a strong, much stronger uh rebel presence than imperial mm -hmm. so what you know you mentioned earlier um that like you had a whole bunch of people in costume and i would certainly not expect that so did you was it mandatory to wear a costume or just basically like if you're going to go to this event you're obviously going to wear a costume is that sort of the, the vibe okay so for this event this was the first one and what they're they're going to run a series now because they have the success for this one you basically had to wear your factions colors and then you could be a rebel or imp without a costume and they'd give you an armband. And then, you know, that's how you would designate. If you wanted to be a, uh, 
an outlaw or a Mandalorian, you had to send in a costume picture first and explain like why you should fit in uh, because they had a limited number of slots and Mm -hmm. all of us had costumes who wanted them. Yeah. And like, so are people showing up in like stormtrooper outfits? Like, is that a thing that's happening as well? Uh, There weren't any stormtroopers out there, unfortunately, or fortunately, because like I've worn those suits before and it's impossible to see. And he would take him one step and like crack the skull open. Mm-hmm. Uh, just in my Mandalorian armor, it was bad enough. We had a lot of Imperial troopers, just like in, uh, the plastoid armor. Now, like you'll see in Andor a bit, mm-hmm. uh, there were a few, uh, like, so, you know, no, besides the, the Mandalorians, there wasn't a whole lot of armor, mm-hmm. uh, just some really high quality uniforms. Like you might see as like side dressing in any group of the 501st. Right. But I guess people thought rightly this stormtrooper kit would be a little bit hard to airsoft in. Yeah. Yeah. Not to mention like damage and stuff like that, which, cause those, if, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, those are made of like vacuum poor plastic. So like, you know, perhaps oh, yeah. damage more than your steel Mandalorian armor would. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like my kit was made of steel, uh, which was unusual. The most common is, uh, is either Eva foam, which was turned out to be a really poor choice because mm-hmm. a few people got sh- shot straight through their armor. Yep. Yep. Uh, and then everybody else would use like a fiberglass or a plastic or an expanded, uh, uh, an expanded poly PVC foam, yeah. which isn't quite Eva foam. It's a little sturdier, gives you a little bit more, uh, bounce, but, uh, yeah, I saw a few Syndra costumes and a few, uh, Eva foam costumes get punched holes, punched through them. So I would recommend like something sturdier. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, how does it, how does it show up? Like in terms of the actual, like gameplay organization element like do people show up and they do like a common brief with everyone and like level set with all the different players regardless of factions and you get in character sort of afterwards or do you split up into your own camps and do your own like your own briefs and your own stuff oh so there was a first there was a whole game brief where they did all the safety information about the rock because this was the first time a lot of us had been playing there Mm -hmm. Uh, so then that's when they said okay blind man is the safe word in case of medical emergency, do this. In case of this, do this. Do not shoot at these speeds or at this area or whatever. And then to actually get what the game was going to be for our faction, we separated out. So I had no idea what the goals were for the imps or the rebels or the outlaws until after the game, or if they came to the Mandalorians to hire us for something. Right, I gotcha. Well, that's then I guess that's a good thing. So everyone's getting the same message from a safety perspective, which for my money is super, super important. How big was the, and it's just a side note, it's so funny that you call it the rock because Newfoundland is also called the rock. So that's kind of funny. Regardless, um, how did, um, you, you mentioned that, so it was like a, a 48 hour game. So like over two days, like was it continuous play? You mentioned camping on the field. Like how how did all that shake out? Uh, no, we called at about six o'clock the first day went from nine to six and that's when they called it was starting to get dark and the field owner didn't want anybody playing on most of the field like out in the forest and down in the quarry itself during the night yeah so they ran a night game where everybody turned on their tracers and went for it but it was only a the village area like one village area and it was just your standard skirmishing stuff so i kind of opted out of that pretty quickly uh your usual force on force capture the flag but it was just in costumes in that place Mm -hmm. How big is this AO? That you, so you're mentioning multiple uh, multiple areas. Like how big overall? Like the cross it and stuff. Uh, it's a. It was not small. I want to say it was a couple of acres at least because it was. Uh, you could walk and walk and walk, and there was nowhere, or there were some spaces where you could just not see anybody for a while because it was a really big area. There were four separate village areas, and you had to climb and rock. And I'd say, uh, maybe a click between each one of those, and then you could just wander into the woods for a bit before you ran like out of land and near the edge of the woods was where the rebels had their base. Uh, so it was, gosh, I can't even think of a, a proper, it's like a very large stadium, but I wouldn't say much larger than that. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about your experience specifically. So, I mean, you mentioned that you were on the Mandalorians for those of you who want to see pictures of Matt's sweet Mandalorian. Gift. And I got to say, like I mentioned in the discord, but like, you had a Cape and everything that looked awesome, but Dude, I, I felt so good. Every time the wind whipped up and I'd see my cape go out to the side, I'm like, yes, yes, I'm yeah, standing buddy. here in my Mandalorian armor. Yeah, I can imagine. But so how did that, how did your experience shake out? Like describe, so like, how did it, it work for you? Like on once the game started, you know, the game whistle blows, like what was your experience? Like, what did you, what do you start off doing? Okay. So they started off, so off, all the Mandalorians started in the culvert, which is a three-story building they have in the middle of the main village at the rock. And there was actually, we could climb up to different levels and shoot from a tower, which was, ray shielded uh 
So that was like our home base. That's where we respawn. That's where we go to get missions for Mandalorians. And from there, they split us up into squads. There were uh, three squads of Mandalorians separate. There's like four or five dudes a squad. And then there were a few dudes running the guild and just like wandering, uh, doing that stuff. So I started off in C squad and our job was to protect the mayor when he came to the town to give a speech. And so we came outside, we were immediately attacked and it just sort of went off from there. <laughs> uh, so my first thing that came through my radio earpiece was the mayor's been killed. Find the guys who did it. Uh, so me and three other dudes wandered off, uh, chased the guys who did it and hunted them down. It was the local insurgents, which were, uh, considered to be alien. Well, you know, they wouldn't be aliens to themselves, but they are the natives of the planet. Right. Uh, and so they didn't like the rebels or the imps or the Mandalorians or outlaws or anybody. And so they were always free targets. And so that's how it got started is we were hunting them down, uh, ran into some rebels who unfortunately gunned me and my squad mates down, uh, in the show, you know, the visors are really cool. They have infrared and all that stuff. Uh, in real life, I had two layers of eye pro on. I could not pick a sniper and a ghillie suit out of a tree. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. Hey, uh, so they caught me a few times like that, but it wasn't so bad. Uh, our armor gave us an extra two hits. So you could get hit three times total, which doesn't seem like a lot, but when you're only taking one or two hits as you're running through a field, it, it adds up. Mm -hmm. Uh, so from there we went back to the guild and I spent the first day, uh, hunting bounties and just exploring the field with another Mandalorian just to have a look around. Our first idea was to hunt a rebel bounty. And that was a terrible idea. Uh, cause we got in the rebel base and they gunned us down like instantly. They didn't wait for us to talk to him or anything. It was it was honestly a rough start for the LARPing perspective because everybody just seemed to want to fight. Uh, once the first fighting was down in a bit, everybody sort of settled into the LARPing aspect and into their characters. And then you could wander around and talk to people. And so I, that first day, I hunted down an outlaw uh, who had shot up a uh, rebel commander. So uh, it was just me and another Mandalorian. They actually had little RFID tracking fobs out there. Uh, they, they, any of the people who had a bounty on them, they would attach it to their kit. Okay. And so we would wander around out there with this stupid device beeping in our hand. Uh, and if we pointed it in the di different direction and found them, it beeped. And so yeah, we, uh, we hunted down two or three, two or three, uh, bounties that first day, which is good because uh. that's the easiest way to get credits in the game. And the credits are how you pay for upgrades. Like I could switch my blaster to auto by paying credits for the heavy repeater upgrade, which I did. And then I got a, uh, a medical droid, which gave you a self revive after two minutes. Okay. Uh, and so there was a lot of advantage to trying to get a few credits to upgrade your character. Uh, plus they had a few real actual airsoft guns for sale in the stores during the game that you can only buy with the end game credits. Okay. Uh, so like, uh, there's a few different companies that make star Wars blaster 3d printed parts for uh, airsoft replicas. And so they had a few of their things that they donated to this whole game so that they could get their stuff out there. There were a few like grenade launchers and stuff. Uh, after that, I, I just, man, I just settled into the world and enjoyed it a little bit. I found a Cam Tono with the other Mandalorian. Uh, we turned it in and got credits for that. Uh, there was actually a reward if you brought it to Captain Solo and then he give you credits for bringing him the container closed, or you could find the code and open the containers and uh, take whatever is inside of him. Mm -hmm. uh, we ended up taking the credits. We found the code. We took the credits from inside the container, threw a few rocks in there, sold it to Captain Solo anyway. Uh, and he didn't open it till we were gone, so that was pretty cool. So all uh, these this... all these characters, like uh, like the Captain Solo you're talking about, or like the rebels that had like a bounty on them, uh, or the the Xenos, I guess the the aliens that you were that attack you, are those NPCs that are players, or are they part of like the game staff? Uh, the the alien insurgents were game staff. They were particularly there to pop in when they needed to to make things move. Okay. Uh, the rebel players uh, were a like the rebel, uh, the bounties were all actual players and they would admin would find a player and say, okay, you've got a bounty on you. Now here's your radio tracker. Uh, captain solo was a part of the admin team, but he was playing himself. Okay. So like if you came up to him and you said his real name, he would respond to you and tell you the admin answer and be like, okay, the actual admin is here. We have a medical station here or whatever. But if you came up to him and captain solo, he would you know, be in game. If you shot Chewbacca, he would shoot you that sort of thing. Okay. And uh, he like uh, each of the, the the each of the faction leaders would usually hang out at their base. Like anytime I wanted to to go back to the Mandalorian culvert, we had our Mandalorian armor there 
who was the one who gave out our bounties and stuff. Or if you wanted to find Captain Solo, he was in the cantina, where you could also trade credits for energy drinks and snacks. That's awesome. And so, and the the players with the the RFIDs and I guess the the trackers that you were using were those like uh, apps that you had on your cell phone or like devices that the the game was providing to you? Because I've never heard of that. That sounds really cool. Uh, no, it was actually devices that they provided to us. I had never heard of them before that. And it was uh, honestly like it was a little brick just about the size of a phone. And uh, in one of my pictures that I posted, you can actually see me holding it. And it's literally just like a little satellite dish in your hand that you point out in different directions and it beeps and you get to them and it's a, a, a little, maybe the size of a nine volt. It's just a little radio transmitter. And they had it strapped to wherever. Really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So in terms of coming back to the gameplay, so you guys are, you know, you're, you're, you're this middle faction. And then in addition to whatever you're doing, the battle around you is also happening between the rebels and the Imperials, right? Trying to control, um, I forget the name of the resource that you mentioned that they're, they're trying to, they're trying to control coaxium. Coaxium, It was called Boulevard, but yeah. So, Uh, yeah. So, so, so how do you experience that in terms of you're in the middle of this as well, right? Well, any time that you saw a bunch of rebels or imps running in the direction, there was sure to be something going on that way. So depending on your mood and what you were up to, you would either avoid that area <laughs> or uh, go towards it. Like there were a few times when I was out wandering and I would see behind us in some distance, there would be a patrol of rebels or imps. And I'm like, I don't want to deal with them. We'll just scoot off along real quick in another direction. Because uh, the imps, you know, they credit to them. They acted like a bunch of arrogant jerks who owned the planet, even though they didn't, it was beautiful role-playing on their part. And they would just stop you and annoy you for several minutes at a time and try to steal your, your lootables. Uh, Cause anything that you picked up from another player that was considered a game item could be looted at any time by killing a player. And so you had to hide your stuff or make sure that they didn't see it. Uh, but also a few times the imps hired us cause they had a better resource pool and they were able to hire us more often than the rebels to make up for the fact that the rebels had a bigger player base. Mm-hmm. Uh, it didn't quite make up for it. And the way I assume that a normal Milsim event would by having the, uh, the PMCs go to a team because we are all a bunch of clunking tanks. Yeah. So unless we were actually in the middle of a big open area, we weren't super useful as backup during fighting. Uh, but it was something you had to keep the, uh, an eye on all through the day, no matter what else you were doing, there was a good chance somebody would run into somebody they didn't like and start a firefight while you were trying to say, place a in the cantina which is actually a thing they had uh you know it's a star wars card game Mm -hmm. and and, uh so like half the time i was doing my own things and then the other half of the time we were hired by the empire to go fight and, and partake in their little battle but otherwise i wasn't really looking out for their interests like if i saw a container of coaxium i would take it back to captain solo or whoever and try to get credits for it instead of taking it to the imps even though they would want us to yeah, gotcha, gotcha. So uh, yeah, I want to come back to a second. So you mentioned uh, lootables. So what are lootables that you're talking? Because obviously we're not talking about like people's like airsoft guns and stuff. Obviously, clearly, like personal items that are owned by the player, are probably not. But so what? What is what is considered a lootable? Well, the the big obvious one that I went after the most was uh, each of the bolivos, the the native insurgents had a. We're wearing kyber crystal necklaces, and each one of those was worth 100 credits. And so I, whenever I saw those guys, I would chase them down, shoot them, and then they'd give me the necklace, and I could take it back to turn it in. But any time between where I found them and getting back to turn it into my base, somebody else could take it from me because it's a game item. Gotcha. Uh, there were a few others, like the Coaxium, the Camtonos. Uh, at one point, there was a briefcase with some liquids inside of it. There was a, a viral weapon that the Empire was... Uh, distributing and we had to find a pilot to take it off planet uh, these guys really like thought through the side quest aspect of it and and added a lot of depth into the play by adding all these different items that were universal but also that added a bit of tension to it because you at any time could lose these things if you found them and didn't get them turned in or do whatever right away yeah was this your first experience with an airsoft airsoft larp uh yeah actually it is uh i've been involved in like mild LARPing before I did SCA and stuff. And that leads to a small amount of like LARPing. Just, it just happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is my first time bringing airsoft into it. And it was, I think it was the right choice for this particular uh, venue because airsoft guns, obviously they look like real firearms, which is what industrial light and magic used to make all the blasters. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
So anybody who's carrying an M4 can make it easily enough into an A280 blaster, which, you know, only casual fan like casual fans won't get, but super nerds will be like, aha, I recognize that from the Battle of Hoth mm -hmm. because they actually made it at the time out of M16s with just adding parts on. And so Airsoft is a really good, uh, it doesn't take you out of the universe like some people have suggested nerf or whatever. And that just, when you see a nerf gun, you know that's a nerf gun. Uh, when you see a blaster, it looks like a blaster, it takes you into the galaxy. And like after a while, it's super easy to fall into and just absolutely be absorbed into the world. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it was nice because I had my AAP-01 and I could just draw it out real fast and blow people away. Didn't feel like a fool for carrying a pistol like I normally do in game. Yeah, uh, yeah, because it is legit like a blaster. It's a crude weapon, but, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it, it's funny because I remember many, many years ago, I'd say probably like 15 years ago, I was talking to a guy who was the first person I'd ever talk to about like a legit Milsim and reenactment. And one of the things that he had talked about and he's like, you know, what I'm really trying to get to is a point where I can experience even 5% of what it would have been like to be there. So he's a World War II guy, right? If I can experience 5%, then, you know, that's pretty cool. And when you, I hear you talk about this, like, obviously this is a fictional world we're talking about, but you can still get that sort of almost that same sort of immersion where you're like, holy, holy moly, like I'm in, I'm in this environment, right? Yeah, dude, it is awesome. And I mean, I understand. I, I remember it was actually Johnny on the podcast said that he, if he could feel even 1%, then that would be it for him. And for me, this was a little bit more than that 1%. It was everybody there was a super fan, right? Big enough fan to go to, in costume to a event in the middle of Missouri, in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. to all go essentially have a con by ourselves with airsoft guns. Right. Yeah. Legit. Yeah. Uh, and so everywhere you looked, there was a dude who looked like he belonged in the universe. There was a Wookiee over there. There's some Imperial troops over there. That dude looks like a rebel commander, 100%. And so it was super easy, as long as you didn't stop to look at the cameraman or whatever, to let yourself just absolutely be there in the universe and get, be and react like your character should. Mm -hmm. Like I actually stopped a few times and said, okay, what does my character want to do here? This isn't what I'm going to do because this is a game part. This, this is what my character would do because it's the thing he does, right? Mm -hmm. And I like to think I'm a, you know, a nice enough dude in a normal context, but my, my Mandalorian wasn't so much, yep. uh, you know, like somebody tried to sell me something. And as I reached for credits in my pocket, I shot him instead. Uh, <laughs> and a few things like that. Right. And I felt kind of bad about it later, but I'm like, man, it's what my character would have done. And I'm going to go for it. It was, it was really cool to be immersed and like actually be in the character. It was like a big game of Knights of the old Republic. Right. And you yeah. just, oh, it's my dude. Did, it, did you or did anybody who you were talking to at some point feel it was like too much, like it was too intense? Like the role playing aspect? Yeah, the role, play, the, yeah the role playing aspect. Yeah, because I know one thing like in, with LARPers sometimes is, you know, you you play a character, but like sometimes it's difficult for people to separate the person from the character that they're playing. Right. And, you know, sometimes like it, like the guy who went to pay you, for example, and you shot him. Right. It's I could e very easily see somebody taking that personally, right? Absent the context that you're playing in. Oh yeah, uh, you know, no, actually, everybody there was like a super good sport about it. Like I shot the dude, and he didn't even buy, go like ah or anything. He's like ugh, and that was it. That's and I came, awesome. you know, I saw him later on in the break area, and like he like high five me. He's like, I wasn't expecting that. You got me, bud. Uh, there were a few points where like we had some game breaking elements, just as airsoft does, where mm -hmm. like not calling hits or whatever was getting on people's nerves, but nothing from the LARP side of it. it. Any frustrations came from the fact that it was an airsoft game played in a very large area on a windy day and everybody was wearing armor and can't feel the hits super well. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. What is from, from your experience, like what was the standout moment for you? Like the, the coolest thing that you, that happened to you that you did. Ah, oh, dude, the very first at the beginning when they, when then, they first attacked the mayor and I took those other three dudes up. Uh, two of them lagged back because they were honestly, they were more there for the LARPing than the airsoft. They were new airsofters and they did not have any confidence in moving up under fire. So they froze and they locked up like rentals. But so <laughs> then me and the other dude continued up and we just hosed the guy. Awesome. I got four kills right off the bat. And he had a machine gun. He wasn't shooting at anything in particular, just sort of spraying BB was awesome. Uh, it looked like a, a heavy repeating blaster and he and I were on, went up there and yeah, like that, that first burst when I got like four or five dudes right in a row and I wandered back into the, into our, uh, culvert with my crystals and I went, I killed a bunch of dudes. Give me all my credits. 
And that actually set me up really good to start off the game because that set me off with a large credit pool relative. Like everybody got 100 credits to start with. Uh, and that started me off with those crystals. I started off with 500 credits and I went up and I uh, played Sabak and got a few more credits and I did some bounties. And so it actually set me up really well to start off with because I wanted the the repeating blaster mod because I'd never used my uh, my gun in game on full auto. <laughs> and that was that was a whole whole blast and a whole can of worms for everybody who came in my line of sight. A literal uh, blast. <laughs> oh yeah, dude. I, cause I, uh, no, I would give him a hit him with the, like the figure eight. Just yeah. like, uh, so that, that was it for me. It was those first four or five kills as I charged up the hill. It was just so awesome. And like, I, I took all their lootables and went back around and then let's see another really great moment actually was as me and two other Mandalorians had that Cam Tono I was telling you earlier. We opened it up with the credits. And we're like, oh, that's that's not a bad three-way split. And we're sitting there, and I have a launcher on my gauntlet, just mm-hmm. hanging off, pointing in a random direction that isn't them. And the other guy has a a little uh, you know grenade launcher, just a little p- pistol grenade launcher, single shot BB shower. But the dude managed to sneak up on us, and we're talking. We're like, hey, we could split this three ways. And he goes, how about four ways? And I turn around, and both of us have our launchers pointed at him at like point blank. He's like, oh, this was a poor choice. I'm like, yeah, you can go ahead and just, uh, you can go ahead and just go, just pull your dead rag first. And he's like, oh man, yeah, I feel like we were the good guys for not shooting him with 80 BBs on the spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good guy. It's like you, you can still die, but we're just not going to shoot you over. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, especially was he a Mandalorian as well? Uh, no, it's just uh, just some random. I want to say it was an outlaw player who just happened to sneak up on us. Uh, a Mandalorian, we might have talked to him, like, nah, dude, we're not sharing. But, you know, no, since he was another one, we were fully ready to shoot him. And I would have caught him with that blast. It, literally, I was probably seven or eight inches from him with my left arm where my gauntlet had the launcher on it. And probably he's probably not armored either. That could have been. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. Uh, definitely a fair play move on your on your guys as far. Was there any. Uh, um, that, sorry, go ahead. I, I was going to say that's the only time I'm that's the only kind of situation where I'm OK with a bang bang rule. Yeah, I'm yeah. not going to shoot somebody with a grenade launcher point blank when I have the drop on them. Yeah, nobody needs 80 BBs to the face like that. Like, yeah. yep. was there any um, from in terms of like squad based, like tactical gameplay? I know that you were saying before, like you guys are basically like just walking tanks. You can't see a whole lot. It's kind of hard. But did you see any of that? Because one of the things that I that I was thinking about as you were talking about like hiring Mandalorians, is you guys make a great distraction, right? Send oh, the yeah. Mandalorians oh, yeah. this way. Then, you know, so did you see Did you see a whole lot of that sort of gameplay? Actually, yeah. Uh, at one point, the imps decided they wanted to clear the rebels out of the town entirely, like the main town. And since we were right in the middle of it, it was a, a pretty cool thing. Like each squad went out with their radio, and each squad only had the squad leader with the radio. Mm-hmm. Then, if you had a personal radio, you could use it. But that's all everybody had to. Fortunately, my squad had to because there was like a big YouTuber airsofter in my squad named Wormwood, and uh, like he sat up in the tower with his machine gun, and then the rest of us just spread out and talked to each other. And then, uh, so there were, you know teammate moves there where we spread out and took out the rebels by having actual suppressive fire and moving under fire and bounding movement because when we were in the open there was no reason we couldn't do that and we had the extra advantages of hit numbers Mm -hmm. uh so that was actually yeah that that did come up a few times where we actually acted as a squad where we did team-based movement where i went okay you guys go around this way and when would you shoot over my head and i'll go around this way and we managed to push them all out of the town that was actually really fantastic i had a great time with that part uh And then actually like other airsoft stuff came into play and I suddenly realized that everything you guys have been telling me had just sort of settled into my bones. Uh, When I slapped myself in the face on the helmet, doing a shoulder transition. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Uh, I didn't even think about it. I was just like bump and go. Oh, Uh, after the first one, I kind of caught up, but man, it was amazing how much it seemed like a, like the main event after all the skirmishes were practice. Like it's, the way I loaded the ready ups, everything that we had been doing that I've been listening to you guys talk about, and then just, you know, the good air softer should be doing everyone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Listen to Matt. Uh, if you don't listen to us, listen to Matt, at least. It just, it, it was like second nature. Honestly, the shoulder transitions, the ready ups, everything. It was natural at that point. Like I had done it so much in skirmishes. I had thought about it so much in skirmishes that I didn't think about it then. And I was able to enjoy the whole experience a lot more. Yeah. That's a really good point, actually. Because we often we often talk about like you want to make it second nature so you can focus on what's going on in the battlefield, which is fair. Or the airsoft battlefield, I mean. 
Um, but if the airsoft battlefield also happens to be like super cool and engaging and lots of stuff going on, you really, I guess, would get to to uh, take that in a whole lot more and notice all the Wookiees and the whatever else is on the field that you probably might have missed or would have glossed over because you were trying to fumble with your kid or whatever. Oh, 100 percent. There were a few guys out there who absolutely missed it, missed some things because they weren't regular airsofters or they didn't. Mm-hmm. Like I said, there were a few dudes who had not airsofted before and that was their first thing and you could see them fumbling with their gear and i'm sure they didn't have the same experience w- as me because of that because all i had to do the whole time was concentrate on what was going on i knew where my gear was i know exactly how to reload that wasn't mm-hmm. a concern what was the downtime like because you mentioned before and i think that's a, that's a fair thing it's like you basically had all these star wars nerds out and i say nerds I, I, i'm we are kindred spirits just so we're all clear of course here. um like you're all out in this area of the middle of nowhere, Missouri. Um, so, and you have basically your own con, right? Yeah. So yeah. It was, was, it was, it was exactly like that. It was, it was the feeling of like camaraderie that you could only have in pe- with people who are in not only a niche hobby, but a very niche corner of a niche hobby. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's a bunch of people around you who came to the same place to do the same thing, despite the fact that it took months of effort, thousands of dollars, all that to do this very specific thing. So you know that they are just as committed to it as you are. Uh, and so you, you get the deep star Wars lore out there. You get people talking about stuff that has not been relevant since Disney took over or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, and so we'll be like, Hey, remember back in this day when this book and this thing and people are like, Oh yeah, I remember because of all this. And like, that doesn't count anymore. They're like, it does for this game. Cause we all know it. <laughs> uh so yeah it was like it was like that it was very very chill a very friendly camaraderie experience uh, a couple of lightsaber fights broke out in camp because that's what happens in these sort of situations uh you know you get two star wars nerds together eventually they're gonna make lightsaber sta- sounds and start fighting with sticks but we're yep. all a bunch of adults with actual high quality uh fighting lightsabers right yep. <laughs> and so even though there wasn't any of that on the field for eye protection purposes because you don't want to knock somebody's eye pro off yeah so uh at the camp at night, there were absolutely lightsaber fights and stormtrooper noises and all the usual stuff you expect is everybody pretending to be their favorite character and then breaking out because suddenly they realize it's camp time and we're all eating. We're like, ah, this is great. Yeah, that's awesome. And so actually, you just prompted another question for me. No Jedi, hey? That's, uh, that was there was form. there were two. There was an Inquisitor and there was a Jedi, but there was a general. There was a general no melee rule because of the danger of knocking somebody's eye pro off. Yeah. Uh, these two were given special dispensation. They worked for the field. Uh, they had full seal goggles with like an actual goggle strap, whereas a lot of people had like safety glasses. Uh, and they were only on the field for half an hour to for story reasons, right? There was a Jedi who was running away, and then there was an Inquisitor. They had a big lightsaber battle. Everybody watched it. I shot the tar out of both of them uh, because one was just standing on a hill, and I saw the opportunity. And then the Inquisitor came up with a squad of just dudes, and I laid them all out. <laughs> Um, that he had a Jedi healing, but it felt really good at the time to just like, ah, yes, got the jump on you. Uh, but no, otherwise there were no, no Jedi. There was just the one there for thematic elements to move things along a little bit. Yeah. And, and like, I guess, you know, cause one of the things in other kinds of LARP, um, the stuff that like, you know, um, Thanatos, so Galen would be doing was like, you know, magic can be a thing. And so you have spells and stuff. And I guess that's not a thing that was replicated in this particular LARP because it wasn't really the focus, right? Yeah. No, like they, they, they did replicate some of the other things. Like uh, at one point the empire was able to call down an airstrike, which was just the admins throwing a handful of EG 67s, like 10 all at once on a rebel position. (laughs) <laughs> and stuff like that, right? So they could say, okay, uh, so there's a Star Destroyer that just dropped in the system and they're going to fire on the Rebel area before you guys move in. So then they would just do that sort of thing. Uh, but no, there's no magic. Obviously, we could all buy thermal detonators at the store, which were just EG-67s. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are allowed whichever grenades, but you know, the uh, the Jedi and the Inquisitor used the Force during their fight, but it generally, you know, it wasn't a, a thing we had to deal with the whole time. Yeah, just for cinematic, quote unquote, cinematic uh, reasons, right? Exactly. Yeah, this sounds, I mean, I, Star Wars is obviously so, so cool. And I, I can't imagine, like, I think this is every, you know, you're describing like every child who watches Star Wars' dream, really, of like being in that universe. Like, the, I think about like, what is it? There's a park that like, there's a Disney park on the East Coast 
like is it Star Wars Edge of something? Edge of the Galaxy? Oh, yeah, the, the Edge of the Galaxy. Right. And that's the whole idea is you go there and you get to just be in the universe. And that's very much what you did, except in a abandoned rock quarry instead of a, <laughs> instead of a, you know, uh, well, yeah. And, and like, so- actually, no, that, that's a great, that's a great point because it was a very similar feeling. The first time I went to the galaxy's edge at Disneyland in California, because I'm from California. Right. Uh, it was like stepping onto another world. And like all the decoration was like that. All the, the cast members were in character. And it's just this feeling of awe of being in the universe. And at the game, it took a little longer to settle in. But once you did, it's just like you could feel the immersion. And every, every like you said, every five-year-old boy's dream to be out there playing Jedi and Mandalorians and Rebels and all that. And actually having something to do with it. Having fun with your buddies. Not being, obviously, in any danger, but being able to recreate that situation. Yeah. And I think there's there's a lot to be said as well about, like, you know, you think about, like, a Milsim, where the two factions are made up. Or like they're imaginary and the, the conflict is imaginary in the sense that it's just, you know, they don't, you typically don't necessarily want to tie too much into like real world conflict, especially nowadays, which sort of will leave there. But I have a lot more knowledge about Star Wars and the Star Wars universe than I do about some fictional conflict that was, you know, dreamed up by some, a couple of game organizers. And so it's a lot easier for me than to immerse myself into that universe because I know about, like, I'm not a Star Wars expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I know enough about it. And I've watched the movies, you know, hundreds of times that I can go in there and be like, yeah, I, I, I see what's going on here. Right. I know my place in it. Yeah, that is, that's really cool. Cause you, you have the intellectual property, like you said, whereas you have the knowledge, you have the background, you have the childhood, right? Yeah. Guys like us, we, I grew up with this everywhere. Star Wars was my favorite thing. And, and, you know, whatever they want to call their NATO versus Russ for, in different terms is still to the eye NATO versus Russ for. Yeah. And, and so this takes a step fully out of that. And, and I, I like that honestly, cause you know, I was in the army and I don't care to bother with any of that again. It just really doesn't appeal to me mm-hmm. uh, like this did because it was not, it doesn't have anything to do with the real world. I didn't have to see any real world camouflage or anything like that. I didn't have to, or as you said, like a made up faction, I didn't have to find a dog in the fight in a made up thing that some guy had thought of for the event. Right. Like I already have favorite characters and I already have favorite factions and I don't have to search for motivation for my faction because it's already there. Yeah. And you could create your character's motivation, too, because, you know, oh, Mandalorians typically do this. They behave in this way. Right. They these it, are the exactly values right. that they share. Right. Yeah, totally. So so, you knew, like. Well, shoot, dude, you see the imps coming, you know they're going to behave like imps. You know that they're going to be haughty. They're all, they've all got made up British accents. They're all super arrogant about everything. When you run into the rebels, they're like looking around constantly, and then they're running off the moment they don't see you anymore. Uh, when you went to the outlaws, they were all just like gambling and drinking energy drinks and stuff. It, it was, you know, it was everybody obviously living out the fantasy of their favorite character, and it was totally rad. Yeah. Yeah, I I mean, the, everything you're describing to me is like so appealing. And, it, you know, I, I've done lots of sci-fi conventions and stuff like that. And you know how, for those of you who have done sci-fi conventions, like, you know the feeling that we're talking about when you're just like, you're in this place and it just feels right. Like you're in a place that just feels correct for your particular person. And I can only imagine that that was like that, but plus plus for you, given how much of a Star Wars fan you also happen to be, right? Oh yeah, dude. It was it was everything I could hope for out of the event. Honestly, the guys, there's a little growing pains. You could tell that they were like it was their first time putting on a Milsim event, but they hit it heroically. Mm-hmm. Uh, the and the the world building was impeccable. Like I said, the only issues that came up the entire weekend were related to the game of airsoft and nothing to do with these guys' world building or the characters or LARP because it was. It was the easiest thing in the world to just fall into something we've all been imagining since we were kids. Yeah. So what would you do differently next time? Like in terms of like kit or character, like what are some of the things that you're taking away from this going like next time it'll be even better because I'm going to do. like. Well, I'm going to tighten up my kit because I realized that my plates rattle a lot when I move. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually going to be adjusting all of my costumes so that my plates ride differently. So that my armor fits a little differently. Uh, I'm going to. So that's like on that side is adjust my loadout. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not playing for the Mandalorians next time. I'm playing for the outlaws with my Mandalorian armor because I 
uh, don't want to be hireable to Imperials. Yeah. So you're going to, are you going to be the same character with just a different story or a modified story? How are you, have you decided? Oh yeah. We're the basic idea or, you know, they're the, the admin's idea. And the thing that generally comes up in the discord group where we talk about it is that everybody's going to be continuing their character through this. And as different players come and go, they'll be included. But uh, everything you do as your character is carried on to the next game and we'll do like a persistent uh, role play. So we won't pretend like we've seen the same dudes again. Yeah, like I won't yeah, yeah. see Thane Darkstar, who was the dude that I met there, and say, ah, oh, there's Thane Darkstar. I fought against him on this place at this time. Uh, but I will still act the way that my character, they Urum, the Mandalorian, would. Uh, and I'm actually taking like, oh, I had this bad experience with the imps on Bolivar. So when I go to the next event, that's the reason I'm not going to play Mandalorian because I don't want to work with the imps. And instead, I'll see what the what the outlaws have for me since I sort of drifted that way anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's it doesn't hurt that I, I actually have like a l relatively large number of credits to get me started off during the next game. <laughs> yeah, you're just making that cheddar, right? That's that's, that's right. Like, this sounds so awesome. Like, what are, um, when is the next game? Is that already like in the books or? Yeah, the next one is in Wisconsin in May. Uh, shoot, it's called Ambition's Toll. And that's all I know about it so far, except we're, uh, we're building characters and everybody's putting pictures of their kit as they improve it and try to do repairs or make adjustments after this one was called, uh, Survivor's Endeavor. Okay. And it's. And so this one was based two years before the Battle of Yavin, the first Star Wars movie. And so the next one will be based a few months later. And then uh, hopefully factions will change as we adjust to what would have been going on in the fictional universe. Uh, like Han Solo will eventually move from the Outlaws team to the Rebels team is mm -hmm. the plan, like one or two events down the road. And so they want to actually create a persistent world where yeah, there's going to be like more people that come in and don't, but there will also eventually be a core group of players who will be coming to these events and will create the world. Yeah, that's how many players were there for the first uh, the first iteration? Well, this one, like I said, was about 150. There were about wow. 20 outlaws, uh, about 20 mandos, and then uh, I'd say like 60 rebels to 50 imps. And then by the second day, there were like maybe 20 imps left. Uh, but yeah, so it was a good sized turnout. Uh, plenty of people, plenty to do, plenty of characters. Yeah, this this sounds like a dream, man. Like I, uh, I, it, it it's the kind of event that I think at least once in your airsofting career, if you're listening to this, you really are, and it doesn't necessarily have to be Star Wars themed, although this one in particular sounds amazing. But like it's this, it's really the kind of thing that I think a lot of airsofters would do well to experience at least once, because it's really the, you know, the power of airsoft as opposed to you know like doing that you can do the same thing with paintball but it's not quite the same and you get all like yucky and covered and stuff and you don't want to wear a costume that's going to get ruined by paint and all this kind of stuff and exactly pretending for like you know I th you think about like world war ii like reenactments and stuff like that where yeah you're you're shooting you know firearms that are blank fire or whatever and like you're pretending to be hit or deciding to be hit or whatever is it? like airsoft brings all of that together right Exactly. Yeah. It, it, it brings, like you said, it, it's more immersive than paintball. Like I said, mm -hmm. it's more immersive than nerf. It brings you into something that no other sport can really bring you into. And yeah, I absolutely agree with you. If I'm not saying necessarily a star Wars event, like you said, but go to a big event, try it out. It's, it's an entirely different experience than your weekend skirmish or your, uh, the same play play at the same places that you've done forever before, because like, it was like the whole thing as an entire experience hit me together at the end. And it was just like, bah, that was the best weekend. Yeah. And it's not something I ever would have experienced playing at my CQB field at home, even though they're trying to put on some other events here. It's just, man, like I was just so glad I did it and didn't like brush it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, 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 I really hope that one day I get to, um, you know, experience an event specifically like that. And I would love to do, love to do a Star Wars event for sure. Um, but I, you know, I remember some of the events that we've put off here where you have those, those LARPing moments that just sort of, 
you just get a glimpse and it sort of expands that horizon that, you know, that's that immersion you're talking about. You realize like, I just stepped out of my own body and my own universe and entered a completely different one for a minute, 10 minutes, an hour, whatever that is. Right. And that's a really special feeling. You're not wrong even a little bit, dude. It's like, it is the dream come true. It's becoming the person you've always wanted to be for those few fractions of a minute or those, that one experience. And you can suddenly feel like, it's, it's just, you know, everything that you dreamed of or you thought of or pretended when you were a little kid and you're suddenly there and it's just so fulfilling Yeah. and whatever, whatever your passion is, guys, like try to chase that down and experience it in the best way you can. Cause it was it's indescribable. I would almost say it's a religious experience. Yeah. I, I know exactly what you mean when you say that, you know, like, uh, I, <laughs> I don't know. I just, I always think about this, this time where like we were doing a, uh, we were doing a, a scenario game where we were role playing as villagers in this foreign village. And we had told players. That oh, you spoke French, right? Yeah. And I shouted at these guys, uh, cause they tried to sneak in and they like two youngsters, like they were, I don't know, like 13 or 14 and they tried to sneak into the village and I noticed that they were coming around. And so I ran at them with my rifle up and I was shouting at them like anger shout but in French and they full on deer in headlights. They were just like, what do we do? What do we do? And they just slowly backed away and left. And I was like, that is the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> so dude, that's, that is so rad. I, I, I know the feeling like there were a few play times. Oh, there you go. I, there was a sniper on the Ridge that we decided we didn't like. So I went yeah. up to talk to him and like, at that point, everybody was into full, full on LARPing mode. So I rolled up to him and he didn't shoot me. And I came up to him like, Hey, bud, the Mandalorians would really take it as a personal uh, favor if you didn't sit up on this ridge where we didn't like you at. And he's like, oh, I, I don't really care about that. And then I shoved my launcher into his ribs. And I'm like, yeah, I don't really care about that either. <laughs> That's and, and hilarious. Just, oh, dude, it was, it was great. There were just a few like golden moments like that. And it was just like these perfect role playing seconds. Oh, it was great. I loved it. That's awesome. Uh, Man, I... I'm just, just thrilled at this conversation. Like these are the kinds of, and you said it before, like these are the kinds of things that just show you what Airsoft can be like and can really motivate you to keep playing for, you know, if you're in, we talked to, you know, a few weeks ago about what do you do when you're in a slump? Imagine being in an Airsoft slump and going to an Airsoft game like this. Guaranteed, you're not gonna, you're not gonna drop Airsoft after that, right? That's, that can be the reinvigoration you need, right? Oh, 100%. Like, uh, I'm adjusting the way I even play at my at my local now because I'm thinking about the next time that I go to play out there. I'm throwing my shoulder transitions just a little further out so I don't hit my helmet <laughs> next time and stuff like that. You'll need to get some uh, sort of like optical upgrade in your helmet, right? To be able to see. I, I absolutely do. And I actually talked to the, to the game organizer about that. So like next time they're not going to have ghillie suits because they're too earthly anyway. Mm -hmm. And we decided that that was a little bit game breaking. Uh, I'm not sure that he, you know, was actually paying attention. I was just sort of going off at the time, but uh, that is something we discussed is like doing things to make it more immersive. Like next time there will be costume requirements. Uh, everybody is going to have to, when they buy their ticket, they can, they have the opportunity to submit their costume then for approval. And if they show up at the, at the time without the costume, they won't be let in, which mm -hmm. At the first time probably would have been a bad choice, but now that they have it established, I think is a good idea because it'll add an extra layer of authenticity into it. Definitely agreed. And I think, you know, too, like I can imagine a scenario where people are coming with extra bits to help people out. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, hey, I don't have, you know, I need something. Do you have like a jacket or whatever? It's like, hey, yeah, throw this jacket on or whatever, right? Oh, dude, there was absolutely uh, one of the rebel players actually before he went out, he sewed together like 10 rebel style caps in case people showed up without stuff uh there were somebody printed out a bunch of the imperial rank plaques so that the imps even if they didn't have like a necessarily imperial costume could have a touch of flair yeah that brought them in uh and then of course there was a bunch of uh costumers out there so when my helmet was broken by the tsa thanks for that tsa breaking my visor <laughs> uh all i had to do was get a new welding visor from a nearby store and they there were a few dudes there with the tools I needed and it was the easiest thing in the world to repair it. There was a guy there with an extra HPA tank. Uh, cause the regulator on mine got broken. I learned some things about flying with airsoft gear. Uh, so those guys were, no, they were super friendly. People loaned out stuff. Everybody made sure that everybody set up the way they wanted to be before the game started. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's just, you know, it's, again, it reminds me of conventions where, like, you got people going around as dressed as, like, quote-unquote, like, cosplay fairies or whatever, where they're just, like, they have all these, like, bobbins and thread and heat, like, heat, like hot glue guns, and they're like, hey, yeah, let me, super you know, glue and duct up. tape yeah, and all. Yeah, yeah, totally, and same sort of deal. It's, like, instead instead of, you know, cosplay fairies, it's, like, droid repair works, where they just bring your stuff and they patch you back together and send you back on. That's amazing. Oh, there's another awesome thing. I'm sorry. There was a juggernaut in the middle of the game. Uh, in the main village, there was a, a droid shop, and that's where you went and bought the, the medical droids. And we were able to bring this droid shop HK droid parts, and he would give you credits for it. And then, mm-hmm. so in the middle of the game, there was a juggernaut in full HK costume uh, who came out and just started laying no into literally way. everybody around him. So it was all three factions throwing grenades, shooting everything, trying to get this droid down. It was awesome. <laughs> that's I wouldn't like to be the guy in the droid costume, but uh, yeah, that's amazing. Well, Matt, I can't thank you enough for sharing this experience uh, with me and with everyone listening. It's just, it, it's really one of those magical moments that hopefully all of you at some point who are listening get a chance to experience something like this in your time playing Airsoft. So thanks so much for making the time and sharing everything with us today. Dude, I'm always happy to be on. I like talking to you. I really enjoy your podcast. I can't say that enough. I'm going to be honest. I binge it sometimes when I run out of audiobooks. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm always happy to come on and talk to you about it. And I always have an argument to make to your latest podcast and then it goes out of my mind by the next time but i always feel like i can talk to you guys about airsoft stuff and it's really great yeah if you guys uh aren't in the discord these guys drop in and they're great all the time to talk to uh and they have great advice and it makes you feel like a part of a larger airsoft team and uh, i highly recommend them well i'm glad to hear you say that and if you want to see some pictures of matt's uh, mandalorian costume they're on the discord and they are definitely worth worth looking at but Guys, the link to join the, the Discord is in the description of this of this video or this podcast episode. Thanks so much for listening, and we will talk to you next week.